Now, I know most of you are going to look at a question like this and just tap out immediately. And I get it. And that's fine. We all have to have our sacrifice plan of which questions we're going to do, which ones we're going to skip. I actually really like these questions. And I think that they are easier than they sound. You just got to be able to like read the code. So let me kind of show you what I would pick up as I was going through, as, as I always do, but especially here. So, you know, we got to complete the text. So I'm going to read it. Dumb summary is kind of on my mind. What can I pull out of this thing? What are some strong words? You know, so that first sentence is a doozy though. The morphological novelty of echinoderms, marine invertebrates with radial symmetry, usually star-like around a central point, impedes comparisons with most other animals in which bilateral symmetry on an anterior-posterior head-to-tail axis through a trunk is typical. For most of you, that is not English. But most of it is, is kind of obvious, right? So the morphological novelty means the, the weirdness of the way it looks. Morphology is the way it looks. Novelty, that's an important SAT word. Something is novel, it is new, it is weird, it is, it is innovative, it is different. So yeah, it's they, they look weird. Um, and it impedes comparisons with most other animals. So it's hard to compare these echinoderms with other things. Um, that's kind of all I get, honestly, from there. So then they talk about the, the shape, but fine. Particularly puzzling are sea stars. Okay, well... That kind of says what it's supposed to say. I don't have to interpret that really deeply. Thought to have evolved a headless layout from a known bilateral origin. All right, more science stuff. We'll come back to that if we need to. Applying genomic knowledge of these acorn worms, close relatives of sea stars, and thus expected to have similar markers for corresponding anatomical regions to the body patterning genes of the sea star, these people observed activity only in anterior genes across the sea star's entire body and some posterior genes limited to the edges, suggesting that. Okay, well, they, they tell me what I need to know, right? They're, they're literally giving it to me, right? There's activity only in the anterior genes across the entire body and some posterior genes limited to the edges. So my dumb summary is that it's really important for the anterior and very not important for the posterior. But most of you are going to be like, anterior, posterior, what the heck is that? Well, they, they told us, right? So this is how a lot of these things work, is there are words you need to know to just be good at reading generally, right? Words like impede, novelty. Um, I would say those two are the big ones. But then we have words that are much more specific to the topic of the passage. And those are words that I don't know either. But if I need to know them, they will explain them to me. So anterior, posterior, head and tail, guys, you got to know those words, right? So there you go. So what is, what are we, what's my dumb summary here? Something like these things are, have anterior or head genes over their entire body and some posterior or tail genes limited to the edges. So these are almost all head <laughs> is what a sea star is. Little tail. Okay. That's, that's what I get, right? They're almost all head and very little tail. That's the dumb summary. So let's see. Let's see if that thing kind of sounds like that, all right? So despite the greater prevalence of anterior genes in sea stars' genetic makeup, so prevalence means how common it is. That's another one of those words you have to know regardless of the, the passage, right? Prevalent means, you know, how common it is. So there's a lot of head genes. So that checks out. Posterior genes active at the body's perimeter are primarily responsible for the star-like layout that distinguishes sea stars' radial symmetry from that of other echinoderms. Well, it seems to be saying that the tail is limited, right? So this is, this is making the tail, right, the posterior genes primarily responsible. But if we're saying they're limited, I don't love that, right? It's almost like we're saying the head genes are good, are important, and the tail genes are bad or unimportant. So this is trying to say maybe that the tail genes are important. So this seems to be wrong. So cross it out. B, contrary to the belief that they evolved from early ancestors with the bilateral form typical of many other animals. Okay, so let's hold off on interpreting that. Sea stars instead originated with an atypical body layout that was neither bilaterally nor radially symmetrical. It doesn't seem to be talking about heads and tails here. So maybe this makes sense, but I'd love it if they used words like anterior and posterior because that's what our dumb summary is kind of about. So let's move on. C, 
Although the two species are closely related, there is only minimal correspondence in the genetic markers for head, tail, and trunk region development in the sea stars and the acorn worms. Well, minimal correspondence. Isn't the whole point of this that we're comparing the worm to the sea star? So if you tell me that there's minimal correspondence, then aren't you telling me that that's a bad comparison? I thought the whole point was that this is how we know anything about the sea star is that they're similar. So this seems to be undermining the experiment. So I don't like this at all. This, this seems bad. D, rather than undergoing changes resulting in the eventual elimination of a head region in their radial body plan, so let's, let's keep going, as previously assumed, sea stars morphology evolved to completely lack a trunk and consists primarily of a head. Primarily of a head, almost all head. Completely lack a trunk. Is a trunk a tail? We can go back. I remember them using that word. Um, yeah, anterior, posterior, head to tail axis through a trunk. So they don't have a trunk. I'm, I'm good with that, right? I mean, trunk, tail, I'm, I'm good with it. D is the answer. That's all I would do. So this is, this is a much easier question than it seems, but we have to get past the weird vocabulary and just be okay with like, we're going to do a little translating here. But I think this question really cuts to the core of like the kinds of words that you need to memorize because you are hopeless without them and the kinds of words that we're allowed to not know because the passage will tell us if we need to know them, right? Anterior, posterior, you know, I, I, I've been around long enough that I, I would have been able to figure that out without the help, but the help is there on purpose. Like they're telling what, us what those means, head to tail, anterior to posterior, like they're giving you that because they're not expecting you to know that. And, and that really helps us out because then we can understand our dumb summary. We can understand the choices better. It's, it's, it matches our dumb summary so well. But yes, we need to understand words like prevalent, um, contrary, impede, morphological is probably kind of low on the list of vocab words to study, but kind of helpful since the shape of animals is kind of a, a, a very common topic uh, on these tests. But novelty, certainly a good word to know. Um, I'm just looking for other things. Corresponding. Uh, yeah, prevalence. We said that one. I mean, look at the other words I focused on. Primarily. Um, choice B made no sense because it's about things that they didn't define for me, really. Bilateral, radial, bilateral. Like, they, that, those words showed up. But notice that they didn't really show up in the conclusion, Right. And, and so I'm leading into that blank. I really want to stick close to what they're saying right before that blank, because that it's part of the literally the same sentence. Right. So, yeah, that's why I was pretty OK just saying B doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Let's move on. Right. It's not about heads and tails as far as I can tell. But if there were if none of the other choices worked, then I would have gone back to B and, and tried to see maybe there's there is some sort of definition I'm missing that's going to help me there. But um, there wasn't and I didn't need it. So what do you think? I mean, um, this is one where I'd, I'd probably, you know, still take a couple minutes on it. It's two or three minutes, but it's, oh God, I can get this. This is I love much better than those graph and chart questions. This this makes sense to me. But you got to pick questions that make sense to you. So if, if even with all this explaining, you're like, no, I would never get that, that's fine. Make sure you save time to do other questions. You got to just rank your passages basically from your easiest to hardest and just try to get the easiest points possible. That means skipping around, finding things that sound good. And if that first sentence completely turned you off, I get it. It's fine.